Good morning, everybody. Now for the next session at Group By, Matan Youngman is going to be talking about elegant T-SQL examples. So take it away, Matan. Thanks, guys. Uh, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, maybe, everybody, if you are down, down under or in Asia. And thanks for tuning in. Just to verify, uh, Pinal, can you see my screen well? See your screen very well, the big, large font, so thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, again, thanks for tuning in and welcome to hopefully Elegant T-SQL solution for uh, real world problems. I will see a few prob problems that uh, we encounter in the field, uh, more common or less common, and we will see how we can use T-SQL to solve them and again, hopefully elegantly. So a few words about me. My name is Matan Jungman. I live in Israel. Uh, I work for Madeira Data Solutions and I, uh, I'm a data platform VP. I write on Twitter from time to time, sometimes good things and sometimes rants about the fact that I need to write a trigger or a cursor inside a trigger or something like that. And I co-host SQL Server Radio with, with my good friend Guy Glanzer. Uh, it's a podcast for SQL Server professionals. Um, and we talk a lot about technical stuff and community stuff and the future of the DBA and so on and so on. We, we release two shows a month. Uh, if you know Hebrew, we also have the Hebrew version. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, please do. And let's start with the first scenario. And the first scenario is maybe one of the less common scenarios in our industry, and it's about queues. So uh, we have a queue of uh, people in that case, uh, but obviously we can use a queue uh, in computer systems as well. Uh, now, usually, um, SQL Server won't necessarily be uh, the first choice or the best choice to implement a queue. Uh, usually you may want to use uh, external systems like so messaging system or RabbitMQ or stuff like that. But sometimes you will want to implement a queue in SQL Server uh, for all kinds of reasons. So what exactly is a queue? A queue is something that uh, you insert something in, some kind of a message or some kind of work that uh, that a worker will, uh, needs to implement. And you enqueue the message or the work, and then that, let's say, uh, you have some, some kind of system for man manager, managing small tasks that you have external parallel roles that each one can implement this task. So you enqueue uh, the work, and this worker Decues the work, performs the work, and and then moves on. So how how can we implement that uh, in SQL Server? So we'll go to Management Studio, and we'll create, we'll use a database called Tests, and we'll create a table called FIFO queue, which will have an ID of uh, identity and a message or uh, with a type of virtual max. And we'll create a cluster in index and a procedure for uh, a, this is the queue push or in queue as we called it in the slide and we just insert the message into the queue. Oh, there is, uh, okay, let's just verify we have the cluster in index and we have the stored procedure and we'll try and get the table and we'll insert 10,000 messages 10,000 very important messages into the queue. And we just let it finish. Okay, and now let's start with the first and naive version. And the way to perform a, a pop of the uh, a queue pop or a, or a DQ uh, is that we will delete the message so so that uh, no other worker can take this message and and perform this work because only one worker performs one task at a time and, and in an atomic operation we will delete uh, delete the message and using 
in the output clause, we'll get this message uh, to ourselves and work on the task. And since we have a FIFO queue, uh, first in, first, first out, what we'll have to do is that we will have to take the first ID, the oldest ID that is in the queue, uh, in order to, uh, again, to work in, in a FIFO queue. So this is the procedure, or this is the first version of the procedure. And now we will go to a SQL query stress and execute the procedure from two, uh, 200 threads, and each thread will perform 10 iterations of this procedure. <clears throat> so a total of 2,000 executions of this procedure. And we will hit go. And this procedure starts to run. Let me give it a few more seconds. And we can see that over here, at the total exceptions, we can see that we have many, many, many exceptions. And if we, uh, if we hit here, we can see that everything is, uh, we get deadlock for pretty much every, every iteration of this procedure. And if we go also to Management Studio, and execute a query uh, on, uh, this is a very uh, long query, but the essence of it is to, is to show, uh, is to go to CSDMOS waiting tasks and see which session is blocked and which sessions uh, block him. And we can see that uh, pretty much we have tons and tons and tons of sessions that are currently waiting. So this is a problem. We can see, we, obviously we can see that there's a problem. And if you close this, uh, we can see that we've been running for about a minute, and we had uh, 241 iterations that were completed. Out of those, we had 200 and, uh, 936 iterations that failed. So something is terribly wrong. So let's um, stop this and see what can possibly go wrong with this elegant solution. So if we see, uh, if we uh, look at the estimated execution plan of this procedure, and I will just close the GoToWebinar now, and go down here, we can see that we have to go twice uh, to the FIFO queue table. We, had, we have a clustered index scan over here, and a cluster in the seek over here. So essentially, these are two resources that can be blocked. So uh, one session blocks uh, the cluster, the cluster index, and one session blocks a resource inside. Uh, uh, excuse, excuse me. Uh, uh, we go to the same index, but to two portions of this index. And since we have two sessions, uh, that each one waits. Uh, for the portion of the clustered index to be released from the other session, we're in deadlock. So how can we solve that? Oops. So for this, well, we have a trick that is called fast ordered delete. And let's see this. Uh, we create a table called to delete, and we might all already have this table, yep. And we will insert uh, one million rows into this table using a question. You know what, let's just truncate the table first. Truncate table to delete. And we inserted uh, uh, 100,000 rows. And uh, if we uh, perform the naive delete, we see the same thing that we saw just now. Uh, we have a cluster index scan and the cluster index seek, and this is not good. But if we create a view that we'll do select a top 100 ID from to do it order by ID, and again, this is an ordered delete. So we create a view, and then we delete from the view. We have only a clustered index scan, so we go to the table only once. Why is that different? Uh, could Microsoft implement a solution for uh, uh, for the case where we don't have a view? 
Uh, I assume so. I don't really know why there's a difference, but there's a difference. So you can use this method, uh, and we can also use CTE to do the same thing. Uh, uh, we create a CTE uh, that will perform the, uh, the select, the ordered select, and then we'll delete from the CTE. So we can use this trick in our queue. So we'll close this and we'll mark this out and implement the second version oh actually that was the first version I'm sorry about that <laughs> uh, uh, excuse me about that so uh, I uh, uh, this is a spoiler the second version of this was to use something that is called uh, to use hints of Rolloc and read past. So what uh, Rolloc obviously means is that we will lock only the row that uh, 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 that we read, that we delete. And what read past means is that if we uh, if we read from the table and see um, and see a resource that is that is locked, we will skip this and go to the next one uh, that is not locked and. Uh, but this uh, this solution um, uh, transforms this solution from uh, a purely FIFO queue into a one that is almost FIFO. So there was a chance that uh, a ID one was inserted before uh, before uh, so message one was inserted before message two, and message two will go out of the queue before message one. Uh, so if this uh, if you need a queue that is, that is purely FIFO. Uh, you drop the read past and you will get it. So let's um, let's alter the procedure and execute one, the procedure um, again. There is one question I think we can mm -hmm. definitely uh, try to answer while we are. Uh, the question is that because there is an ID, uh, it's an order by, and ID is also in a select in a subquery, and we are doing top. The question is. Uh, I think they're saying, why are we not using max or some kind of aggregate function where it does not have to scan the entire table? So if that is, uh, I, I believe if it is covered later on, then we don't have to answer now. But yeah, that's the question. Uh, can you repeat it, please, uh, just to verify sure. I understood it? Yeah, because right now we are just taking ID, top one mm -hmm. ID. So why mm -hmm. are we not using something like max or mean? Uh, instead of just doing ordering that particular ID and just finding the top one, that's a good question. Maybe uh, maybe you can try it. Maybe you can try it. But obviously, in a real system, uh, you 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 will get actually the message and not the ID. So uh, in um, so we we don't take only the ID. The ID is here in order to help us order the message we actually get the message in order to work on it and again the message can be if if this is a message in system this is a message if if this is, is a, a task schedule in system it's a task or so something like that so we don't work only with the id if we if we would work with only with the id uh things were simpler obviously uh, right. so i hope Absolutely. it answers the question Great. So, uh, and sorry about the spoiler, by the way, but let's uh, uh, let's ex execute again a SQL query stress with uh, uh, with the second version. And now we can see that we uh, that we start to run, and the iterations completed is uh, much higher, and the total exception we still got exceptions, but much uh, much less than than we had earlier. So we're at a better state, but things can be better and again this is because we still go to the table twice let's see uh, let's see the execution plan so we still have a cluster index scan and a cluster index scan again because we don't have the fast auto delete trick we go to the table twice once for scan and once for a seek and uh, things are obviously uh, not as good as they can be so now we will use the spoiler version 
this is version three. We, uh, we have a CTE that performs that select top one message from the FIFU queue using Rolloc and the read past. And, and again, if you if you need a strict FIFU, uh, FIFU queue, you drop the read past, order by ID, and then you delete from the CTE and use the output clause in order to get a message. And we will execute the procedure again. And while it runs, let's see the execution plan. And we can see that we have only one cluster in the scan. And a cluster in the next delete. And we go to SQL query stress. And we can see, well, we did have well, one exception. Let's see what it is. Uh, we did have one deadlock, not sure why, but obviously things are much better. And we can see that we finished uh, taking things out of the queue very, very, very quickly. So this is a very nice trick. If you, if you need to implement some kind of orders delete, uh, uh, you can use the fast order delete, uh, delete trick. And if you need to implement the queue, definitely uh, check that out. Uh, any question? Any more questions up to now, Pinam? Good. Right now, that was the one question you answered it very well. So we can go to the next trick. Definitely a nifty trick. Uh, one thing which uh, comes to my mind is right now that do you think like like this is a fantastic trick? But it, like uh, many, I see this in a lot of time in the industry. People just use a temporary table to achieve the thing which you have just done it, and that's way more complicated. It's not consistent, and sometimes we do not. Um, it even does not match what we wanted to delete. Delete because they cannot come up with this kind of situation. Uh, they they cannot write this kind of query, and they end up writing things first. Go to a temp table where they write the IDs, and then they use the temp table select in a in or not in, and delete the data. I see all the time people doing it. It's like it's such a big thing instead of just nifty four lines, which you did. Cool. Cool. So hopefully elegant. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. 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 Great. So uh, this is um, this is number one. And now we will talk about ID generation. So um, we have all kinds of uh, all kinds of situations where we need to generate an ID and then we turn that to the client. If, if, if you have a, a single insert, a procedure that inserts a row and then returns that to the client uh, in order for the, uh, for the client or the calling procedure to insert this ID into other tables and so on and so on. And we have all kinds of scenarios of uh, single inserts or multiple inserts and we have all kinds of ways to do that in SQL Server and let's see those. Okay, so uh, the first way is obviously uh, the most known, I guess, and it's called identity. So we will create a table called table with identity. Uh, ID int, identity starts with one, and the increment is one. And we have a procedure that we insert to the table, and the procedure we insert to the sum column column. Uh, we'll insert the value of something and return the inserted value uh, to the identity column using select at at identity. And we will uh, execute the store procedure. And we can say that we start again in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on and so on. Now, uh, uh, Actually, there's a problem with this solution, and let's see what the problem is. Let's say uh, we create another table with identity, and from the first table, uh, when we insert a row uh, to the first table, a, a, a row is inserted into the second table. So if we execute the stop procedure, we actually get the values that were inserted into the second table. So se uh, select at at identity doesn't return the last value of the identity uh, that is inserted um, 
to the table you actually inserted, but actually uh, it returns uh, the last value that was inserted uh, to an identity value inside the session. So th this is kind of weird. I'm not sure why someone would want to get the value of the second table rather than the first table, which he actually inserted, inserted to, but maybe there's some kind of scenario for that. But in any case, uh, we will fix the problem and we will use the scope identity uh, function in order to get the ID that we've actually inserted. And when we execute the stop procedure again, we can see that we get the right values um, uh, from the table we actually meant to insert to. So uh, th this is uh, this is an identity. Now uh, for the relatively new kit, five years old, and it was uh, uh, introduced in SQL Server 2012, and it's called a uh, sequence. And sequence has all kinds of uh, advantages over identity because it's not uh, it's it's not um, strictly uh, paired into a specific table. Uh, this is an external object to, uh, to a table and we can use a sequence uh, in order to insert data to many tables. If you want to, if you want to show the sequence, um, uh, we can change uh, we can change the data type of the sequence more more easily uh, rather than changing uh, an identity column inside a table and so on and so on. So we'll see how we use this. So uh, we will drop uh, the table and the sequence that we have. And creating sequence is very easy. Uh, we create a sequence, have, have the name for the sequence, uh, the data type, int in this case, starts with one, increment by one in this case, and cache of 1000. So what does cache mean? Uh, since uh, generating values for identities and identity and sequence uh, have to be uh, have to be uh, written to disk uh, this uh, this can take some uh, this can take some time so uh, if you if you work with cache this means that uh, we will uh, SQL server will uh, generate 1000 uh, will actually uh, allocate a range of 1000 IDs and then and then just uh, take those from memory and give those to sessions. And this can help for systems where you have many, many inserts into, into a table and you, uh, you want to maximize performance. And then you, you, can, you can use the cache in order to, uh, to avoid this uh, performance problem. Again, this is a problem only in relatively high-end systems, but it can be a problem. And the downside of this is that if you have a system that you, uh, that you strictly have to have um, uh, consecutive ideas. Uh, you can't have gaps in the ideas. In this case, uh, we can have a gap of up to 1,000. If you can't have this, then you can't use the cache. And by the way, there, are, there was a bug in SQL Server 2012 that people who use identity uh, started to see some gaps in, uh, in identity columns. And this is because they implemented cache of a default of 1000 for identity as well, and then they fixed it, and now in SQL Server 2017, you have cache for identity as well. So uh, that's a very good matter, and just, uh, I, I'd say in a 20, 2008 also, the bug which you mentioned was there. Uh, oh, also really? It, had, it was popped up, and I think a lot of people yeah. went uh, crazy in 2008 itself because they never thought about this would happen and it was jumping in and I think later on some kind of service spec and things it was fixed um, at the time and I think that while I was going through the group by chat uh, uh, on a Slack I think one another uh, individual I think uh, T Friedman also brought up another a very interesting function ident underscore current so yeah, so I, I ident current is the is the current ID, identity of the table. Um, so so what he means that we, we can use ident current in order to uh, in order to return the ID it was inserted. Right. So it, so th this this can be a problem because ident current. Let's say we have uh, we have many many uh, parallel sessions that insert data into the table. Uh, let's say you have 100 sessions inserting data all at once. So if you use ident current, you will not necessarily get the value that you've inserted. 
because right. from the time you, you insert it until the time you execute the select, uh, you could have one uh, 100 ideas that were inserted. So um, there, this can be problematic. Yeah, this can def no definitely that can be problem. But the people who need this latest ID, they can use it. So it's it's, it's own yeah. place. But yeah, scope identity does the task, which uh, identity definitely miss out. And I think yeah. there is a one last question. I think before we continue, it's on a question and answer. Is that another option is to get identity? Uh, another option to get identity is to use output close. Right, um, uh, perfectly correct. Yeah, th that's another option right. to to use. Right. Um, so, by the way, Pinal, yeah. yeah. yes. can you think of a, of, a, of a reason why someone would want to use at at identity rather than output or uh, scope identity? There is really no reason for using it, but I think a lot of people use it when you ask them why are you using it, they are not familiar with other functions. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. they come up from a different background, they some come from a different SQL relational database background and they just come across this, I think at the rate, at the rate identity, at the identity is so popular, I yeah. think they just think it's the same thing, I would just use it. Uh, personally, I stopped using it, I either use ident current or another one, but I think it's all about just goes to the same, all the little education and little nuggets you know. Not everybody knows this, uh, this is elegant and most important thing what you just showed, uh, it's just beautiful, I mean that's how we should be doing it. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, for, for some reason, the, the first function that people know about about identity is at at identity, and not scope identity. I, I wonder why. Um, it was the same case for me. Yes, and I think I would little bit blame on the early books which we read uh, in my <laughs> career because I was. I, I, it's not a bad thing. It was available there. I read that book, and I think I got it from there. And I never moved on. I remember the first thing which I read. Never learned the second alternative alternate better yeah. options. So I think that is the yeah. case. Anyway, yeah, sir, over to you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we will uh, work with identity as and what we will do is we will use a default value for the ID column. Instead of using identity, we will use uh, the default value is the next value for the sequence we've just created. So again, we will uh, drop the uh, we will create a table and we'll drop the procedure and let's do that again. Um, well, I guess we haven't created a sequence. So let's create it. And we will drop the drop and create a table again and drop and create the procedure again. And again, we insert data to the table, and then, uh, and we we declare the ID as next value for the sequence, and then we insert data into uh, into the table into both columns, the ID and the sum column column, and then we just select the ID. Obviously, we didn't have to insert data into the ID column because this ID column has a default value. So we, c we can use whichever we want. We can either use a default value at the column level or grab the next value into, uh, into a variable and insert into the table. And we would actually do a stop procedure and we can see that we have the value of one and two and three and so on. And so this is a sequence. Now, just um, a little trick. Uh, let's say you work prior to SQL Server 2012 and you want to implement a sequence without a sequence uh, because you have a few tables that you want you want them to share the sequence value and, and you can't do that obviously in SQL Server 2008 because you only have identity. So uh, what you can do is Create a table, a sequence without a sequence, uh, and it uses an uh, identity, starts with one, uh, inc increments by one. And what you can do is, uh, since uh, identity is not, uh, uh, isn't rolled back during the transaction, what you can do is you can insert, uh, in inside a transaction values to the table, and then you roll back, and then you, s you select scope identity, and you get the value that You've just uh, you've just inserted, and that way uh, you get a sequence without a sequence and keep the table 
uh, keep the table empty. And this is only one of the cool tricks I've learned from Itzik Bengang. Um, so it's really worth uh, following uh, following Itzik. So this is a sequence without a sequence. I haven't checked that in production. Uh, um, I can think of a few problems with this solution in a very highly concurrent system, uh, but if you, uh, it's definitely uh, worth checking if you need this kind of solution. Okay, now we, uh, up till now we've inserted only single rows. Now let's to, let's go to uh, inserted multiple rows. So we will create a procedure called uh, insert multiple, and we will uh, insert into the table with a sequence that we have. Uh, three rows in this case, using the values clause, we will insert three rows, uh, the first row will have something, the second row will have something else, and another thing, and we will use the output clause into, uh, in order to get the IDs that we've just inserted. So we will drop and create a procedure. and execute it, execute it, and we can say that we have ID 6, 5, and 8, and now we execute it again. Oops, something is wrong with zoom it, but when we execute it again, we can see that we have the next rows and so on and so on. So this is, uh, this is a way to insert uh, multiple rows uh, very quickly and, and get the IDs uh, out to the client very quick, quickly in order for the client to do, uh, to do whatever the client needs to do with it. Now what about inserts and updates? We, uh, we want to support both inserts and updates, so we have a few ways to do this. Uh, and the naive way is to uh, Let's drop a procedure and create a procedure. What we will do is we'll create a temp table uh, that will have a DID. And uh, then what we'll do it is we will uh, we will uh, we will update uh, the table. Uh, uh, we will join between um, ex excuse me, I, I forgot to say that we have uh, we we have an external uh, table that is called inserted values. And we will use these inserted values in order to update or insert uh, rows into the target table. So uh, what we will do is, uh, uh, in order to support both insert and update, uh, we, uh, we will have an update and get the updated values into IDs to return table. And then we will have an insert and using the output clause, uh, get the values into the IDs to return table. So again, uh, and we insert only uh, only values that aren't inside the, our target table, uh, obviously. And then we uh, we select star from uh, from our temporary table, which will hold uh, all of the inserted IDs. So we will create a stop procedure, and we create a table of inserted values and insert two rows into this table, and now we execute uh, this procedure which supports both updates and inserts, and we can say that we got the IDs of 1 and 1000, and we execute again, and this is the update stage, but again we see that we got the IDs of 1 and 1000. And this is because uh, uh, we inserted ID 1 here and ID 1000 here. Now obviously, uh, this is um, uh, this is one way to do it, but there are other ways, and the natural way to do it is to use a merge, the, the merge operation, which, which was uh, added in SQL Server uh, 2008. So what we will do is we will use the merge uh, operation, and the merge uh, uses a, a select from the inserted value table, and this is the source. And we have some kind of a join, a join term between the source and the target. This is the source, and the table with the sequence is the target. And when uh, we have a term of when matched, when matched update, and when not matched, insert. So in this case, 
uh, in one operation, uh, we um, we get the option to to have both inserts and updates, and we also have the dollar action uh, uh, word that will show us whether we updated or inserted this specific row. So we create a store procedure. And we dropped, uh, we will drop the table and insert the temp table and insert some values and execute the store procedure. And we can see that for uh, the first operation, uh, the first row 1001 was an insert, and the second and third row were updates. And when we, when we would execute it again, we can see that everything is an update. So this procedure, uh, again, supports both inserts and updates using the merge keyword. Now, another scenario is, let's say that we want to support both inserts and updates, but uh, if, uh, if you have an ID that already exists in the table, we don't want to update it. We want to re return the, uh, this ID. Uh, we don't want to return any error, but we don't want to perform the update. So what we will do is we will uh, declare a dummy variable, and we will use the merge. But uh, on the when matched term, we will just update the dummy variable. Uh, we won't update anything in the table. Uh, we just have the dummy variable uh, for it to be updated from uh, 0 to 1. Uh, and obviously, in the insert uh, for the uh, for new values, uh, uh, those values will be inserted into the table. So again, uh, we will uh, generate some values and execute the procedure. And we can see that we had one insert for the first row and two updates, and now we have only updates. And so th this is a cool trick. Uh, um, for some time it wasn't so cool, but because for some reason uh, this pattern, and I, I blogged about it once, it, uh, uh, this post was called the weird merge that kills the cluster. And this is because uh, this pattern for some reason uh, generated um, a stack dump for SQL Server, and when you have a stack dump in, C in an always on availability group, uh, um, uh, you have a failover. Uh, so we got into all kinds, of, into a very weird situation because of that, uh, but Microsoft fixed it, I believe, and uh, you can feel free to, uh, to use it. But again, check that you don't have a stack dump after you use it. So those were the inserted IDs. Any questions, please? I think right now it's all fine. Um, uh, this is one, so it's good. Um, a lot of uh, good conversation going on a stack, uh, uh, right, Slack right now, which we can talk about this later on. But I think um, a lot of people are saying uh, it's interesting to see what you are demonstrating. And um, along with the queuing operation which you demonstrated, I think we can also use uh, uh, a service broker and other options too. Oh, yeah, but I, I think what we just, yeah, yes, yeah, and yes. this is also uh, another method if you are not want to go and use those fancy tool. And there are there are always individuals who like to write things themselves. And uh, and when they leave, I think everybody in their organization are always scared. So yes, I totally make sense. Yeah, very cool. And I, sh I should have mentioned it. Obviously, in if you work with SQL Server, Service Worker is the natural way to do it. The problem is, I think Microsoft uh, with Service Worker did um, they did an amazing job, uh, amazing engineering job with building Service Worker. You can get to amazing paces with it. But on the other end, they, uh, they created a new language. Uh, and when you start working with SQL with service broker, you have to learn all those new terms, and uh, this people people uh, don't really like it. So absolutely, uh, it's a PDF. I, I, I think it's like uh, you learn one language, you don't want to learn the another thing. Teach me once, I will want to use yeah. it multiple times, and I totally get what you are saying. I think same with me when I was learning service broker, I just had the same feeling. So yeah. that's yes. One and, more and question, just from my side. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, continue. 
No, so I, I, I just wanted to say that uh, there's another very interesting implementation I, I uh, haven't showed. Uh, there's a guy called Thomas Kaiser. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, he doesn't work with SQL servers anymore, but really amazing guy and works with, with uh, uh, used to work with the top uh, the top systems in the world, and he had an implementation of uh, uh, um, a queue that is only updated. It, it's not inserted and deleted, so it's it's not mm -hmm. uh, shrinking and enlarging. It's it's only is a it's a queue with the same size, and it's only updated in order to uh, to show that um, that I've taken the message. The message is, uh, or the row is marked as deleted, and you implement that using two sequences of uh, uh, sequence for insert and sequence for uh, uh, for delete. Um, uh, I, I actually have this uh, this demonstration, but uh, uh, it doesn't show any um, any performance improvement on top of the one that I've showed. So uh, <laughs> so no, I no. haven't showed it, but Fair. I can show the code, and it's very very nice. Uh, uh, so, Pinal, go ahead and ask, and I will turn on the light because I see that uh, it's really dark over here, so I will turn right. on the light meanwhile. No, absolutely. I think the one of the questions which I was really, really, I ask everybody when people ask me about this one, about the merge statement, and I and my question is what I ask to everybody. Have you really used this in a production system except one? except like first time when you're learning you use it but have you ever used it second or third time in a production system or have you ever seen people using it more than once after beyond the learning curve so uh yeah the, the merge statement actually I, I used to really hate it uh because first of all the syntax is a little weird you get used to it but the the syntax is a little weird and if you work with the highly concurrent system it has all kinds of problems it's not really it's not really atomic and you can get the two situations of it's not really locking and all kinds of deadlock and concurrency issues uh, but for systems that uh, that are not uh, highly concurrent and mainly for ETL scenarios or scenarios li like this the, uh, this scenario is based on uh, on a system I've built for a client and the melt statement really came in handy so since then I really like it but you have to know when to use it if you have an ETL system uh, it can be uh, excuse me if you have a uh, a highly concurrent uh, OLTP system, it can be tricky, it can be problematic, so you really have to check it. All right, no, fantastic. I think that was the question so far. I think Slick is loving this conversation very much. People cool. are talking about Rabbit M MQ, and there is a poll there, so everybody who is watching live, you should go and participate in a poll, and rest of the people uh, who should just join the Slack and talk to us. Continue with the presentation, sir. Cool. What, what is the poll? What is the question in the poll? I think Paul, uh, the question is, uh, if you have implemented a queue, which solution did you use? And options are service broker, Rabbit MQ, SQL Server tables, yes with something else, and no. And I think no is leading. <laughs> okay, interesting. Interesting. So, so actually, I actually use the T SQL, but maybe in my next tools I will implement it with, with something right. else with the. And as Brent say, and Brent says that he has left uh, left out the option of duct tape. So if he has put that one, I think everybody would have selected that duct tape. Like they say, <laughs> there is a like one of my boss used to say, but I would con um, he used to say there is no permanent solution than the temporary solution. So you put something, oh, think yeah. this is there for oh, a while, yeah. it's gonna to be there forever. Anyway, sir, over to you. Yeah. yeah, great. So now let's talk about, let's see what we have in the slides. Date and time. Some uh, some issues and tricks uh, with date and time and mistakes uh, mo most of us do when we start and then we uh, then we understand we made some mistake and try to try to fix it. So um, for some reason it always goes to the dynamic search. So uh, uh, maybe we'll get to that. So we use data that is called uh, sale for you and we'll drop the uh, drop in buses the statistics aisle and let's say we want uh, we have a table called sales.orders and we want to get all of the orders uh, out of July 2016 and we'll include the actual execution plan and we can see that we have a table scan and over on the message 
pages, we can say that we have uh, 92,000 logical reads. So let's see what we've done wrong. Um, the problem is that if you wrap a column uh, with a function, even if this column has um, uh, has an index equals of a can't use uh, can't use this index. So uh, let's see what we can do. Uh, the solution is to use uh, between, uh, and we will see where we will say date and time between uh, the start of uh, July 2016 and the start of uh, August 2016. And when we do that we can see that we have uh, an index seek and the messages, over on the messages, we can see that we have 3,000 logical reads, so uh, much better. Uh, the only issue is that it's not entirely correct because the between clause uh, includes both uh, um, uh, both edges, uh, both of the sides, and what we need to do is to either use this thing uh, because, uh, or better use just this thing. Select so start from says dot orders where uh, date and time greater than or equal to the start of July and less than the start of August. And obviously when we do that, we have the index seek and we have 3000 logical reads. And for some reason I have that here, I already have this index, uh, so we will move on. Now the mistake, uh, mistake number two is, uh, as we said, is wrapping a column with a function in the where clause. So uh, let's say you want to get uh, the sales, uh, all, all of the sales from the last, in this case, 520 days. So uh, again, and we, talk, we talked a little bit about uh, Added identity uh, earlier. Uh, I think most of us, when we start writing T-SQL, uh, uh, we encounter the date diff function because uh, because as humans, uh, this is more natural. We uh, we say that the, the difference in days between today and this order is 520, and, and this is this gets us all of the all of the orders from the last 520 days. And when we do that. Again, we can see that we have a table scan, and over the message, we can see again those uh, 92,000 logical reads. Uh, so what can we do? Because again, we have an index on the date and time column, so why can't SQL Server use it? Uh, so what we will do is, the way to solve it is to use solve kind, some kind of opposite function. Uh, we will use, instead of using date diff, we will use the opposite function of date diff, date add in this case, and we will take out the date and time column uh, so it won't be inside the function. So what we will do is say where, uh, where date and time is greater than date add, day, meaning we will work in days, we will, we will take uh, 520 days uh, we, will t we will take the, uh, today and, and uh, we do subtract 520 days from it and this will get us this will get, uh, give us the solution so we get uh, the rules that we need and in the execution plan we can see that we have an index scan instead of a instead of a table scan uh, we have, a, uh, excuse me, we have an index seek on the orders on, on the date and time column, the, on our index. And over at the messages tab, we can see that we have only 2,000 page widths. So again, much, much better. Moving on, how can we make it is, uh, even better? Uh, we can create, uh, we can add to the index that we already have, we have uh, uh, the customer ID column. Se uh, since we query for the customer ID column and it doesn't exist inside the index that we have, we can include it in an index. And when we do that and execute the query again, we have only 16 page reads and 
only a single indexing. So again, we have uh, we have a few stages. First of all, uh, design, uh, write your queries correctly. Don't use f uh, functions. Excuse me to uh, to wrap columns. Uh, have proper indexes, and for those indexes, have have included columns as much as possible in order to prevent uh, what we call the key lookup, or in the past we called it bookmark lookup, uh, in order to, to jump from non-clustered indexes into the clustered index or to the table in order to get the values of the rest of the columns in your query. And now let's drop this index. Now the only problem is, um, so uh, uh, as as I say here, by the way, is it really the same uh, between uh, date diff and date add? And I think my, most of the uh, more experienced uh, guys in the crowd uh, know this pattern and and have used it in order to transfer a date um, a date diff to date add. Uh, this is a relatively common scenario, but the problem is that those functions don't work. Uh, don't work exactly the same, and let me prove that. Um, so I will use uh, the the date add method in order to uh, in order to get the values, and using the accept clause, which uh, gives only the rows that exist in the first data, data set and don't exist in the in the bottom of the data set, I will get the values that. Uh, that are returned from the first query and not from the second query. And we can see that we have 155 rows that we get from uh, uh, from the date add solution we don't get from the date diff solution. And this is because uh, they work differently. Date, uh, date add gets uh, the exact uh, time of now and takes 520 days back. Uh, the date diff function just compares bet, uh, between days. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it treats uh, a day as a, as a one unit, and in some situations, uh, uh, rows that, uh, that are close, uh, close to midnight or something like that will, will get left behind and, and, it, and making a, a long story short, uh, we can get values that uh, we didn't think we will get, or we didn't get when we when we used uh, the dative solution. So it won't, in in most cases in, it won't matter. But if you work in, in a situation where it does matter, uh, what you can do is uh, you have all kinds of solutions. Uh, and Guy and myself, uh, Guy is the CEO of Madeira, and uh, in some situation we both uh, wrote uh, wrote a post about dative and date add. At the same week, so you can you can uh, see guys' solution. My solution is just to use both uh, uh, both terms, uh, both function in the uh, in the same select. So uh, the date add solution gives us the index seek, and the date diff solution gives us uh, the quote unquote correct solution business wise. So. Uh, if we if we see, uh, we can see that we have uh, uh, almost four uh, four thousand page, page reads, but it's not the 90, 92 thousand. And in the execution plan, we can see that we have our indexing. So this way, we'll get you both good performance and good results. Oops. Okay. Uh, any questions, uh, Pinal? Before I move to this to the no, next. Uh... I, I, I think this time there is absolutely no question. I think a lot of right. conversation. This is definitely elegant and uh, yeah, interesting to see also. So nice. Thank you very much. Awesome. Let's move to awesome. the next one. Awesome. By the, by the way, how how, uh, how much time do we have until when? Uh... Well, to answer you that way, we have some definitely time. I think we still have, I believe, half an hour, but um, I think that's the, the max we can go. So up to you. Uh, let's say 20 awesome. to 25 minutes max, you can take it. Sounds good. Okay, so uh, now uh, let's um, let's talk let's talk about another scenario and. This scenario is again from uh, another client. I work. Uh, I worked for a client who used to buy and sell stocks, and uh, um, 
in some situation he wanted he ran a query uh, which um, uh, which wanted to get only the stock buys from specific hours from uh, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Not really sure why, but this was uh, this was the scenario. So uh, let's see uh, let's see how we do it. And I insert all, all kinds of uh, data into into the table. Not really interesting. And we will go uh, and we create. A, let's just verify we have the index. Yes. So uh, let's just see this table. And we have a table called stock buys. We have the stock ID, buying price, buy date and time, and buy time in this case, we, which we will try uh, to use, and we will see why. And we will have statistics IO. And for a start, what we'll do is we will use the uh, buy date and time. Uh, we will convert uh, the buy date and time column into date and say, that this is between uh, those uh, between those dates, and when you convert to the time, uh, you you convert this column to time data type. You say, give me only only the stocks that were bought at two p.m. So we run this, and it takes some time, and we can see in the execution plan that we have a cluster on the index sick, and over, which is theoretically good, but over the logical reads, we can see that we have a 22,000 page reads. Obviously, in a production system, it's not so, too much, but we, we can do better. And why can we do better? Because over in the, in the cluster on index sick, we can see that we have a sick predicate and the predicate. Over at the bottom, we have a sick predicate, which, which is the value that is used to traverse the index. Uh, but we also have a predicate. And this predicate, in, in many cases, can be very, uh, very, very problematic because uh, uh, when SQL Server builds statistics, the most dominant part in the statistics is the first value of the index, which is which can be used as seek predicate. But if you filter, uh, but if you filter on other parts of the index or on included columns, SQL Server in many cases won't, uh, won't have a good estimation about the amount of rows that it has, and this can lead to some cardinality issues and some problems. So let's see how we how we fix those. So a uh, second try is that we don't really need to convert this to, uh, to, to date, but we still do need to convert this value to time in order to filter on 2 p.m. So let's do that. And we don't see too much difference in, in terms of logical reads. Uh, we do see some difference in terms of the execution plan, we can see that we do, we again we have a cluster index sick, but we get a parallel plan. A uh, SQL server uh, SQL server got to the, the to the conclusion that a, a parallel plan uh, will be better, so it performs the the query in parallel, and in many cases random will be better. Uh, but it's still not not enough because we still have twenty two thousand pages. So fair try. What we will do is uh, we will add the buy time column. Uh, th this is a computed column, and we uh, uh, and the value is the cost of buy in time to time. So we essentially get the time the time value out of the daytime value, and as we saw, um, I already have this value in the table, and I create an index on the buy date time and buy time. And I already uh, have this index. And now when I do that, it doesn't help too much. And again, because SQL Server couldn't know the exact value 
uh, of rows, the, the exact amount of rows uh, uh, inside um, in, in each day we have many, 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 many stocks and many, many rows that were bought. And since this value, uh, uh, the time value, is the second value in the index, SQL Server can't know that. And, and again, the plan is not, is not good enough. Uh, because we have to read many, many, many rows, we have an index sick. We get to a specific day, but in this day we have to read a very big amount of rows until we get only to the rows that are at 2 p.m. So, what can we do? Let's move on. We will use a date table. And a date table is just a table with all of the dates, in our case uh, from the start of, I believe, 2010. And we have each and every hour. You know what? Let's, let's look at this table in our case. And we call, yeah, we call it dates, order by uh, one, two. And we can see that uh, this is from the start of 2010. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, this is actually all, all of the minutes from, uh, uh, all of the minutes from the start of uh, 2010 and until 2020 something like that. So a date table can help us uh, can help us do that because for each and every uh, hour or minute we will have only one row in the table. So if we go on this table we will very very quickly filter many 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 rows out and using this table and using a join we will, we will get very very fast into our actual table, our stock buys table, and since we've uh, already uh, mitigated many, many, many rows out, query, the query will be much faster and we will read many less rows. And when we do that, again, what we, what we do is we join between the uh, stock buys table and the dates table on the daytime, on the daytime column. And uh, the filter itself, instead of the stock buys table, uh, we filter on the date table, again, from uh, uh, 2010 and until 2011, and uh, filter only the rows, only the stocks that were filtered, uh, in uh, that were bought at 2 p.m., and when we do that, we can see that we have only 4,000 page reads instead of the uh, 22,000, and in the execution plan, we can see that we have an index seek on the stock buys, an index seek on the dates, and things were very, very, very fast. And we also have, instead of a parallel plan, we have a serial plan, which in this case means that SQL Server uh, estimated uh, that uh, the cost of the plan will, uh, will be lower uh, to use a serial plan, and in this case, this is a good plan. Now, we, uh, there's all kinds of debates about a parallel plane, good or bad. Uh, in uh, obviously, in many cases, it's uh, it's very good. But in some in some cases, it just says that uh, the query isn't written uh, good enough. So in this case, we made the query uh, be written better, or or actually use a, a more proper a more proper tables or table structure. And we got a serial plane. In this case, this is a good thing. Now we can uh, we can make it a little more elegant uh, if we use a, an inline function because uh, at uh, this client where uh, he has all kinds of analysts that perform the uh, perform this search and all of the time uh, when I told them about the solution uh, they would have uh, to change all of the queries. Uh, uh, to perform an inner join to the ten, uh, to the date table. So what they can do is use an inline function. Uh, and what we do in, in and why inline? Because the um, uh, table value function and scalar, scalar functions are very 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 bad uh, because they work row by row. If I uh, execute a, a function on a one million row table, we'll have to execute the function 
uh, one million times. On the other hand, if we write the uh, the function as inline, it's essentially not a function. It's, it's just a set-based uh, solution that SQL Server uh, can uh, can take and add that to the query, uh, and it still runs fast, and it gives us the opportunity and the benefits of uh, encapsulation and reuse uh, that, that are uh, good pro uh, pro uh, programmatic skills, uh, programmat uh, programmatic uh, behavior. So what we will do is, uh, as we say, that it will turn stable and just return uh, uh, select one in this case uh, where date and time is equal to uh, the parameter of date and time and the date time is between date one and date two and the time is equal to the time. And when we run this function, uh, we, we run it using a uh, cross apply in order to get only rows um, that, that have a match inside the function in this case. And when we do that, we both use a function and have, uh, and have views and encapsulation and we get good performance of 2,000 uh, or 3,000 page reads and a good execution plan. So this is dates and inline functions. Any questions, Pinal? Actually, question died. I think people are just getting things, and uh, or maybe they are just um, grasping things much faster than we think. So I think we are good, <laughs> but just keeping a time in a mind, we should we should just go maximum of maximum of ten more minutes. Okay. So I, we are, we are yes. No problem. So I, I will talk about dynamic search uh, really, really quickly. I won't, won't get uh, into uh, very into the details, uh, but just wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, let's say you have very uh, some uh, developers or program managers that want a dynamic search screen. They want they want to filter the option to filter on on everything or not filter on anything and stuff like that. So how can you implement that inside SQL Server? And uh, so let's close this. And uh, so what we will do is we will write uh, a store procedure called find products uh, dynamically. And the, fir the first solution uh, is to use um, the naive solution is to say something like this. Uh, the, uh, the select part isn't very interesting. Uh, the interesting part are that uh, we move, uh, we pass parameters, uh, parameter values for the, uh, the parameters that we want to filter on. So I want to either filter on product ID or name or product number or color or any combination of the of them. So uh, what I do is select uh, select the values from the table where product ID equals to the value of the product ID if if it's passed from the client. Excuse me. If it's not passed, uh, this uh, uh, this part of the query where of all product ID is null. If it's null, we just say don't uh, don't take this value uh, into account. Don't filter on the product ID. And this is the same for name, product number, and quota. So uh, what we will do here? Uh, is we execute the stop procedure with parameters of product ID and quota. Oh, sorry, I wanna have the execution plan. And when I include the execution plan, I see that the plan is actually pretty good, but when I go uh, here to the index scan, what, uh, what we can see is that we have uh, over the predicate column, we can see that even though we didn't filter uh, on, all of the, on all of the parameters, SQL Server ha uh, generated a plan that does take that into account. And obviously this, this, this helps performance because SQL Server has had to generate a plan that ex, takes into account all of the permutations and all of the variation, variations of, uh, of those parameters that were passed. And this can help performance because the execution plan is more, 
uh, more complicated and SQL Server had to take more stuff into account. And we can say that we have 604 logical reads and let's see if we can make this better. So the second option is to use a dynamic SQL. Uh, and what we do is select, uh, we have the select part and then we start concatenating. And if in case, in case uh, let's say the product ID is not null, it means that uh, we want to filter on it. So uh, we concatenate that. Uh, else we concatenate uh, an empty value and so on and so on for the rest of the values and at the end we execute uh, the dynamic, uh, we execute the command uh, using dynamic SQL and when we do that and go here we can say that we have a better execution plan that uh, took into mind the values that we actually passed to the stop procedure. Okay, so this is better and let's see, and we have a plan of three logical reads. So this is much better uh, because when, when you work specifically for uh, parameter values, you get a better plan rather than uh, uh, generating a plan for all possible values. The problem is, uh, the problem in this case is a, a SQL injection. Uh, if we use dynamic SQL that way of just concatenating, uh, we can, uh, um, a bad guy can say, okay, instead of concatenating uh, uh, concatenating a value, a parameter value, what it will concatenate is, uh, is this and drop table, very important table. And if we do that, what we see uh, is uh, that SQL Server Sales cannot drop the table, important table. But uh, if we would have a, a user table or an important table, this table would be dropped. And actually the smart hackers, what they do is intentionally they try to generate errors in SQL Server in order to reverse engineer your database. And there are all kinds of very scary videos of our tuple. There's a, a program called Havij that was written by a few Iranian guys. And this is pretty scary how they can map your database and understand what's going on. So um, SQL injection is still dangerous. And what we can do in order to solve that is to still use parameters, uh, but instead of, of just concatenating, what we will do is we will, we will say in, inside the dynamic SQL, a uh, product ID equals at product ID, name equals at name, and so on. And use, instead of exec, we will use SP execute SQL, which allows us to pass parameters and to, uh, and to reuse uh, the execution plan. And when we do that, and pass a value of uh, so first of all we can see that we get a good result when we uh, in, in a good execution plan and when we try to drop the important table nothing happens because uh, because there is not a product number called drop important table so if you if you want to uh, use dynamic SQL with uh, with a dynamic cell screen, this is the way to go and not just concatenate values. And the fourth option, uh, if you just want good performance and don't, uh, don't want to uh, start concatenating values using dynamic SQL, which uh, can be a little hard to debug, what you can do is just return to the original solution and use option recompile, which is kind of magic because what option recompile does is tell SQL Server uh, generate an execution plan for this specific execution and this specific permutation of parameters. And when we do that, we get a good plan of free logical reads and a good execution plan, which takes into account only the parameter values that we've just uh, that we've just passed. 
Uh, so option recompile is very good and very easy to work with. Uh, the only the only problem is if you uh, if let's say you work at Booking.com or at the ver a very high end. Uh, uh, website. Uh, if you have, uh, let's say, 1,000 such searches in a second, uh, option recompile uh, will generate a plan for each of those executions, and this this can start uh, getting a little heavy on your on your CPU. So in this case, I would work with a, with dynamic SQL. Uh, uh, obviously, the uh, the good permutation of dynamic SQL, and so what we, it will do, it will generate a plan for each permutation, uh, but the number of permutation is re, uh, relatively capped. So, uh, so at some point you will start to to get reels of, of your execution plan uh, instead of just generating a plan again and again and again. So I think that's it for uh, uh, for this session, and I will be happy to take right. any questions. So there are no questions, but this is so interesting to see that uh, dynamic SQL comes at a rescue where everybody says, don't use this, don't use this. Now <laughs> the same feature comes and saves you when your boss is asking you to write um, a dynamic search and there is no other way to figure it out. Yeah. And um, I, I, I still remember one case be before we end, I'll just tell you, I see a customer writing a dynamic case. They had, a, they had a only three field. So they wrote like combination of these three fields. So that becomes two rest to three. So like eight different combination, but that's a six actually. And then as this is start building up and you just start talking about the um, uh, two's power and, and it's just become so complicated mm -hmm. and eventually you just end up writing either dynamic SQL or just um, going to this, some third party tool. So I think it's a fantastic to see this one. So definitely uh, elegant solutions. And I think somewhere in a Twitter, I think I heard, I, I read it somewhere, it says elegant solutions can be arrogant. So I don't know how, what does it mean, but this looks amazing. Yeah, if, if, if a developer know the trick, they can be a little bit arrogant and can say, you know what, they know a little more than other. So thank you very much. Last one question, where would you post the code or how to get people access to this code? Uh, so I will uh, post the um, uh, the solution. Um, actually, actually uh, Brent, can I post it on at uh, Groupby or shall I post Absolutely. it at uh, the Madeira blog? Where should I do it? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm totally okay either way. It's totally up to you. If you want to put it on Groupby, you can, or uh, if you want to put it on Madeira. Uh, let's do both. So we, it will either be it, it will be at uh, the Groupby site, at the session page, and I will also uh, put a post over at uh, Madeira. Day data.com slash blog you will see it. Uh, we'll try to do it um, uh, either today or tomorrow. Perfect. Fantastic. Well thanks so much Matan for hanging out with us today. Thanks Panal for doing the questions well, during the session. Guys.